want to take uh, the rest of our time today and, and share a message with you uh, as we we're continuing in this series we've been in called the Homecoming Campaign. And uh, we've been talking about this the last three Sundays now. And if you're new with us, uh, we are in the process of buying 48 acres um, just north of, of Kroger uh, on 68, about a half mile north of there, um, that God has just opened the way for. And we're super excited about that. And uh, starting next Sunday, which will be our commitment Sunday, uh, we are starting a three-year giving campaign with the goal of raising $3 million so we can build a church home where thousands of prodigal sons and daughters in a five-county area can experience a homecoming with their heavenly father. That's the goal. That's what we're doing. And the vision's a little bigger than that in the long term, and I shared a lot about that the first couple weeks of this series, so go check those messages out online uh, if you missed those. Also, uh, the first week of this series, we hand out these booklets. If you didn't get one, out to the right at the Info Center, you can grab one of those uh, on your way out. And that kind of explains more, helps you get prepared to give if you want to participate in this campaign. Um, and then next Sunday, March 6th, will be our Commitment Sunday. We've been talking about this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But we're not going to give offerings towards this campaign next Sunday. We're going to give our pledges. Um, and the pledge is just you taking time, preparing, planning what you want to give over the next three years. And then after you pray and discern that budget for that, get a plan together of how you're going to do that, add up that total of what you, Lord willing, plan to give over three years, and you'll write that on your pledge card next Sunday, and we'll have a, a significant moment in the service where we, where we all give that together uh, for those who want to participate. Um, and then pledges, this, this is not, we're not going to track you down and be like, you pledged this, but you only gave this so far, you know, where's the money? We'll never do that as a church. Uh, this helps you plan and prepare um, your commitment, what you want to do. It also helps the church plan and prepare uh, the, the scope of the project and, and how we structure the financing. Uh, most lenders require you to do capital campaigns, but also uh, pledges. And uh, on average, you can expect, a, an average church can expect to bring in about 80% of the pledges. Coach, we're praying for like over 100%. Amen. All right. Okay. We're on the same page. Um, but uh, just in the natural, natural wisdom, it helps you plan uh, how this project's going to go, maybe the timeline of when we might be able to start, things like that. So that's really what that does. Just a very smart, good thing to do. Um, so that's what we'll be doing next Sunday. We're excited for that. Uh, and so because of that, and be, really because of the significance of this project, uh, we've been, we're spending several weeks to really plan and prepare our hearts for this and for the next three years and what God might have us do. Because as I've shared over the last few weeks, um, think about how often a church buys land and builds a building uh, it probably once a generation, maybe once every two or three generations that something like this happens. It's such a significant moment in the life of our church. And the more significant something is, the more significantly we need to prepare our hearts for, for what God may be calling us to do or how he may be calling you to participate. And so I want to continue in that today. The last few weeks, we've talked about why we give, why God calls us to give and be generous in general. We've talked about biblical finances. Uh, we've talked about practical aspects of planning and preparing. Today, I really want to talk about the heart of the matter, the, the, the spiritual reason at its root. And I'll, I'll say it this way. I believe the highest spiritual reason, the most pure spiritual reason that we give. And from, from the purest standpoint of generosity why we give it's not so much to be obedient it's not so much to accomplish something the best reason we could ever give to God is as an act of worship and what I mean by that is we might give the money to the church because that's his body on the earth right we might give to a homeless person but we're really giving because we love Jesus, right? But when we do those things, the best motive of the heart, the best reason to do that is to do it because you love the Lord and you're grateful and you want to bless his heart because of what he's done for you. And so I want to talk about, as we prepare our hearts today for what God's calling us to, to do, giving as extravagant worship. Giving as extravagant 
worship. The word extravagant in the dictionary means two things mainly. Lacking in restraint in spending money or resources. Or exceeding what is reasonable or appropriate. Absurd. When you, when you do something extravagantly, it's over and above what would be expected. It exceeds what's reasonable. If it's very extravagant, you might even get criticized because of how extravagantly you did that thing. And so I want to talk about giving as extravagant worship. And I want to look at two of the most extravagant acts of worship in the Bible And they just so happen to be two acts of extravagant financial generosity. I'm actually talking about the the story of the woman with the alabaster jar. Now, if you've grown up in church, you you hear the titles of stories. You know, the woman at the well. You know, Jonah and the fish. How many of you have heard of the story of the woman with the alabaster jar? Like at some point in your church history, you're like, yeah, that sounds familiar. I've heard that. Kind of know what you're talking about, what you might not know is in scripture, it's not just one story. There's actually four accounts, one in each gospel. And when you study the accounts of the story of the woman with the alabaster jar, it's actually the story of two different women who both at some point came to Jesus, broke open an alabaster jar and poured out the perfume, one on his feet, one on his feet and his head, but it was two separate occasions. And those four accounts, three of them talk about the latter. One of them talks about the former. And I want to walk through each of these accounts today and, sh- and just talk about what these women did and why it was so beautiful and why it was so ex- significant and see what we can learn from it today. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36, it says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so when it says this woman has lived a sinful life, it's saying she was notoriously a sinner, meaning she had lived in such a way that it's like, oh, she's done some bad stuff. Um, It was a woman of ill repute. Most scholars believe this was referring to prostitution. So most of her life, she's probably lived as a prostitute to make money. And she comes, because she hears Jesus is at this house, she comes there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Alabaster is a, is a type of stone that's similar to marble. And if you think in our day and age, if you get countertops and you're like, are they for mica? Are they this? Oh, they're marble. And we're like, ooh, that's the expensive stuff, right? That's how this was. If you had an alabaster jar, or uh, some scholars believe it, it could, could have been an alabaster box, um, that was like a hope chest, meaning uh, a lot of young women would have saved up money to buy perfume uh, and have it in an alabaster jar, which would have been sealed, and they would have saved it for their wedding day as a dowry to break open and, and use for their, their wedding night. And, and then, it, man, this perfume was very concentrated. It was very expensive, and it was very potent. It was an oil, oil based plant-based oil perfume, very potent, very expensive, very strong, just a little dab all day, yeah, right? And, uh, and so they would break it open, and they would get a little bit and, you know, use it, and hopefully it would last a very long time. Some women would save up, get one of these, and give it as an inheritance to their children, and then their daughter could use that for their dowry and for their wedding day. That's what this was very, very common in their culture. It was as common as like when we get engaged in our culture, we get a nice diamond ring. And like, you know, if you hear like with certain things are status symbols, right? Like a Mercedes Benz car or a, or, you know, things like that. Uh, BMW right now. You might not think that, but that's a status symbol in our culture, right? A Tiffany. It's not just he didn't just get me a diamond ring. All right. He went to Tiffany's, okay? 
he got the purest two carat diamond, right? And it was so pure, it cost $40,000. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. The best of the best, the most expensive status symbol when you had an alabaster jar of perfume. You also have to understand in this day and age, um, they didn't shower as often as we did because they didn't have the ability to. They didn't have indoor plumbing, and it wasn't easy for them to do. So baths were a lot more rare. And so to have strong perfume was very important to people who cared about their hygiene and how they smelled to other people, okay? And so she brings this very expensive jar of perfume, and it says this, verse 38, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, I have to pause for anyone who is new to church because you're thinking, this is weird. <laughs> Imagine you're at someone's house and a woman walks in and starts crying on your feet, wiping them with her tears. What in the world's going on? And you have to understand, that is a little weird, but <laughs> this was actually something common to wash someone's feet. Because in a day and age where you wear sandals, you walk everywhere, you use animals for travel, they poop. You get mud, you get dirt, you get poop all over your feet. And when you're going to a nice dinner, they would, at the very least, everyone would set out a large bowl with water in it. And, you know, if you didn't have, you weren't rich enough to have a servant or someone wash people's feet for them, you could at least dip your own feet in the bowl, right? Similar in our day and age, like, oh, take your shoes off. It's a new house. Take your shoes off, right? Don't, don't tread up the carpet, you know? And, and they would, everyone, it was, cust- it was everyone was expected to wash their own feet at the very least. And so she's doing something that was very common in their day and age, but she's doing it in an uncommon way. She is wetting his feet with her tears. She's wiping them, not with a towel, with her hair. And then she takes this perfume. She breaks open the jar and she pours it out. Here's the thing. A little dab will do you, but she pours out the entire contents on the feet of Jesus. It says, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if, the man, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. See, this man was a Pharisee who knew the Bible really well. And he invited Jesus to his house because he wanted a closer look. But he was skeptical. He maybe probably wasn't in the, the crowd that wanted to kill Jesus yet. But he wanted to know more about him. And he was skeptical. And so he's viewing this as this woman is so sinful. If Jesus were a prophet, he would not be letting her do this to him. Because he would want to be holy and pure and not let someone so sinful worship him in such an extravagant way. You know, some churches are led by Pharisees. Let's just be honest. People who do not know the grace of God themselves. And so they tend to criticize people who extravagantly Worship Jesus. It's a tragedy when someone who knows the grace of God so powerfully goes to church and has to press through religion, has to press past people judging them just to be able to worship Jesus. And if you've ever experienced that in your life and in a room this size with just the maybe couple hundred people in here, that's very common experience in our day and age in our culture. And that is not the atmosphere or the culture that we want to create here at our church. And so if you've ever experienced that, I'm so sorry for you. But I want to just encourage you, please don't misjudge Jesus based on how some people misrepresent him. He loves you. Some people don't come to faith or say, well, I can't accept Christ. I'm too bad. I could never get baptized. I'm, I'm too sinful. 
let me just tell you, you're the reason he died on the cross. That's why he came. So this guy's uncomfortable, this Pharisee. You might be uncomfortable, too, if somebody's crying on Jesus' feet. He's uncomfortable, so he turns critical in his heart. You know, it's funny how quickly people can criticize something they don't understand just because they're not used to it and it makes them uncomfortable. You see this in worship a lot, don't you? You see it when the Holy Spirit really moves powerfully on someone and and people have all kinds of extravagant responses. And people whose hearts are hard and self-righteous and fearful and skeptical criticize what Jesus thinks is beautiful. Jesus senses it, so he confronts it. Because Jesus is love. And true love will at times confront ideologies that are not good. It will confront sin. God will confront your sin because he loves you to pull you out of it. And so he brings it up, verse 40. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. He tells him a story, as Jesus often did. Verse 41, two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Those were large sums of money. Think of it like one owed him $5,000, one owed him $50,000, right? Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said, do you see this woman? Man, when I read that this week, it hit me. Do you see her? See, you haven't seen her this whole time. You've been judging her. There's a difference between judging someone and seeing them, seeing their heart. I wonder if Jesus saw, yeah, you've been a prostitute, but the reason was you were severely abused growing up, and it, it, it totally distorted your mental mindset and what, how you thought about life, and then you were poor and you needed help, and so you made decisions. And, man, some of you who looked down on her would have done the same thing if you were in her shoes. Do you see her? Do you guys see broken people, hurting people, or do you judge them? Jesus is like, do you see this woman? I came into your house, Simon. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered hasn't stopped kissing my feet. It was customary in their day to to give kind of like the Hollywood type of kiss on each cheek. You know, the way the Hollywood people do in our day and age. They do it in Europe a lot still. Very calm. It's like our version of a handshake. Jesus like, you wouldn't even shake my hand. And man, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head. Also something customary that would have been above and beyond, but a sign of honor. But she's poured perfume, which was worth way more than normal oil, on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, listen to this, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Jesus is not saying because she's poured out extravagantly on him, what would be thousands of dollars worth of perfume and done all these righteous good acts towards Jesus, that that is what has saved her. It's not what he's saying at all. He's saying at some point her sins were totally forgiven and she had a lot of them. She was a great sinner, but his grace is greater. And so because her great sin was forgiven, oh, she loves him so, 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 so much that now this is a great act of extravagant love. Her great love has shown that her sins have already been forgiven. That's what he's saying. But then he says, but whoever's been forgiven little loves little. 
So how much do you need forgiving? How much do we all need forgiving? This man, Simon, was just as much a sinner. But he didn't think he needed forgiven for much. So because he didn't think he needed forgiven for much, he didn't honor Jesus at all. Rather, he sat back and was very skeptical. You will never understand the depth of the riches of the glory of God's grace until you understand the depth of the rich, the depth of your need <laughs> and the depth of your own sinfulness. And until then, until you understand the depth of your own sinfulness, you will love God very little. And you'll probably love people very little. And chances are you probably won't be very generous towards God or people. One of the greatest blessings God could ever pour out on your life is opening your own eyes to the depth of your own sinfulness. And when he does that, you will be horrified at yourself. And that's one of the greatest blessings God could ever give you, to truly open your eyes. Not just to see how awesome he is, which is what we pray for all the time. But if you truly see him for how awesome he is, you're going to become keenly aware of how unholy you are. That's Isaiah's vision in chapter 6 of Isaiah. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And I said, holy, 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 you're so great and awesome, God. Is that what he said? No, he goes, wow, I see God high and lifted up. And I said, woe to me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. R.C. Sproul said it this way, the Presence of the holy is traumatic for those who are unholy. It is traumatic. I was meeting with a couple one time a few years ago, and um, tragically, the husband was cheating on the wife, had several times very severely, and the Lord staged an intervention. The wife, please don't ever do this, by the way. She's like, can you meet with my husband? I was like, sure, but you tell him. You need to tell him. And she's like, okay. And she actually lied about it and said, oh, we're, you know, said that, that they were going to meet with us. He didn't know about it. He showed up at a meeting, and I was there. And he's like, what's he doing here? And it was a confrontation. It ended up needing to happen, but please don't ever do that. Anyways, he was broken, and, and he was repentant, and and we walked through it. And... um. I remember as part of the healing process, the wife looked at me and goes, how'd you do it? What, what did God use in your life to make you like you are? I mean, you love God so much. And I looked at her and I said, well, he broke me by showing me the depth of my own sinfulness. And there for a while, I didn't like myself very much because a lot of myself was very sinful. But man, I loved God a whole lot after that one. And then he healed me. And I just love him. And I stay clear of sin because I love him and I know how bad it is now. I lost my taste for it. I don't even want it. I know it's, it's gross. I know where that stuff leads. You want to pray a real prayer. You want to change. You want God to help your life. Stop praying, help me, God, and say, God, break me. Show me the depth of my own sinfulness. And that will be the beginning of your healing. That's a dangerous prayer. It's painful. But some of you here today, you need that surgery. It's painful. But man, it's worth it. And I say it this way. I don't like what I used to do. I do, I regret what I used to do now, but man, I wouldn't change walking through it because I would not love God as much as I do if I had not experienced what I experienced and truly 
got to taste what life was like when I did it my way. And that's where this woman's at, man. This, this self-righteous Pharisee, he, he doesn't think he needs God very much. And so he's criticizing her. He's condemning her. You know, he probably thought this was a huge waste of this perfume. But this woman thought Jesus was worth it. Fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry. This, that was in Luke chapter 7, by the way. Probably towards the beginning or middle of Jesus' ministry. She anointed his feet. Because how beautiful are even the feet of those who bring the good news, right? Fast forward to the end of his ministry. This story is in Matthew, Mark, and John chapter 12. It says, this is six days before Jesus would eventually be arrested and crucified. A week. This happens about a week before his crucifixion. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised, had raised from the dead, which happened just a week or two prior to this. So that, that was very fresh. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. Imagine being at this dinner. Probably just an amazing, joyous event. It says, then Mary took a pint of pure nard. And that's that type of perfume. An expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped it, his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. We know from Matthew and Mark's version, it says they were in Bethany, not at the house of Simon uh, the Pharisee, but at the house of Simon the leper. So these are two different stories. It says she also had an alabaster jar in the other versions. She broke it open. She pours it out on his feet in John's version. And in the others, it says she also anointed his head, just pours it all over him. Verse 4, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. John is not saying they knew that the whole time. They're saying after Judas betrays Jesus um, and hangs himself, takes his own life, eventually they discover, oh, wow, he was actually stealing the whole time. He was, hey, I'll keep the money back. I'll keep it safe. And he was taking money from Jesus's ministry. And they realize, oh, he's saying in hindsight as he's writing this story, oh, yeah, yeah, he didn't say that because <laughs> he, Judas didn't say we could have sold that perfume worth a year's wages so we could help so many poor people. He was saying that because he wanted his cut from what would have been used to help the poor people. Which is interesting because the guy being critical of her extravagant generosity was the one who was the least generous. And in my experience, the people who are most critical of churches asking for money are the people who are least generous or not generous at all. And so they're offended that someone would even ask because they really just don't want to give. People say all kinds of things about church building projects. $3 million? You're trying to raise $3 million for a building? You know how many poor people that would feed? Do you know we also feed the poor too? <laughs> do you know we also do projects to help orphans? You know we do we kind of do it all. <laughs> and if we help people with all the practical needs but we don't do ministry to meet their spiritual needs, we could feed them and clothe them which lasts for a, a day, a year, and then they would still die and go to hell. And so to have a place where we do ministry out of is so important. And why can't we do it all? That's how I tend to think about it. Listen to what Jesus' response is to what seems to be good worldly wisdom, right? Good, you know, the church doesn't need this, church doesn't need that. 
You could give that money to the poor. Think of how many poor people you could help. Listen to Jesus' response. Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Matthew Mark's versions, he says, she did this to, pre- to anoint me for my burial, to anoint me for the fact that I'm going to die. He says, you'll always have the poor among you, but you'll not always have me. Wow. He's like, you'll always have poor. You can help the poor whenever you want. She's done something special in a moment that's never going to return again. Think about this. Jesus said she did it to prepare him for his burial. In other words, Jesus had told his disciples several times leading up to this dinner, you know, this is going to happen. They're, the chief priest, the teacher of law, they're going to arrest me. They're going to kill me. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And there's one verse where he says that, and it says, but they didn't understand what he's talking about. Because Jesus was always using spiritual metaphors, and they thought he was literal. He's talking, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And they're like, oh, it's because we didn't bring be- bread. Pharisees got the best bread in the, in the whole country. We don't have any bread. He's mad at us. And Jesus is like, oh, guys, I'm not talking about bread. But then he says, they're going to kill me, and three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. Now, that seemed impossible. So they're like, oh, it's got to be metaphor. What does it mean? What does it mean that they're going to kill him and then he'll rise from the dead? I don't know. I don't get it. But it says Mary believed him. It says she did it to anoint me for my burial. He had been saying, they're going to kill me. And at some point, she goes, oh, my goodness. They're going to kill him. But I, I believe that Mary believed the gospel because just a week or two prior, Jesus came to her house and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would be alive. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And she saw him raise back to life her brother who had already been dead. And so like Abraham, who was called to sacrifice Isaac. Scripture says he did it because he he just reasoned. God had promised him, through your offspring, uh, it'll be through Isaac. Your your offspring will be reckoned through Isaac. Well, Isaac was a kid. He was eight or ten years old. He's like, well, I don't know. It's confusing. Why would God ask me to sacrifice him? He must be, it must be that he's just going to raise him back to life. And Abraham believed God could do it. And I think Mary's going through the same thing. He's going to die, but he's going to come back to life. He said that. I believe it. And then I think her train of thinking went this way. He's only going to die once. In this day and age, one of the ways you honored someone and showed them how much they were valued by you was how you honored them at their death, at their funeral. If you recall in the Old Testament, They mourned for Moses for 30 days. 30-day funeral in mourning constantly for Moses. If you read the story of when Jacob passes and Joseph is the leader of Egypt, the Egyptians mourned for 70 days to honor not Joseph, to honor Joseph's father Jacob because they so revered Joseph as their savior and deliverer. And so I believe Mary's going, he's going to die. The government hates this guy. They're the ones in power. They they might not let us have his body. We're not going to have control over that. This is my moment to show Jesus how much I honor him, how much I love him. It's not a moment I'm ever going to get again. And I've got this alabaster jar I've been saving. And she goes to the dinner, and she goes, this is the moment. And they would have anointed bodies after they were dead, the way we embalm them so we can have an open casket funeral. They didn't do all that, right? They would have anointed them with perfume so they didn't stink, or rather to cover the smell so they could mourn over the body and be with him longer. And so she anoints him. I read one commentary that said this perfume was so strong, just a little drop would, would, would fill up. A room, a room, right? She pours the whole thing all over his whole body. And this scholar reasoned 
that perhaps six, seven days later as he's being crucified, when he's sweating, tears, drops of blood, that it's diffusing the perfume. And in a moment when he needs it the most, he's reminded of the extravagant generosity and love of this woman. Wow. Powerful. He said, she's done a beautiful thing to me. Judas thought it was a waste. Mary thought Jesus was worth it. She thought he was worth it. See, this act of extravagant generosity, it went over and above what was needed. Could have anointed him with a drop. Could have washed his feet, anointed him with a drop. She poured the whole thing. She was sending a message to the heart of God. She was saying, it's not just about the practical. I'm going to send a message. This is how I feel about what you've done for me, Jesus. And it's going to cost me. But I love you. And I'm so grateful. It's worth a year's wages. In our day and age, in Mount Orb, average household income is $56,000 a year. This, what she poured out, would have been worth about $50,000. Now, I know some of you are doing. We're talking, it's context of us talking about a giving campaign. Oh, man, that, that'd be like me giving $50,000 to this building campaign. That would be an extravagant gift. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That's not a good analogy, though. Because if anyone here gave $50,000 to this campaign, that would be an extravagant gift. But that would be to build a place where we could worship Jesus and others could worship Jesus as extravagantly as we want for generations to come. I would say that's not extravagant or wasteful. I would say that's a good investment. This, would, this was a one night only. This was once it's poured out, it's not valuable anymore. I might be able to collect it and maybe use it on myself later, but nobody's going to want to buy it after I've poured it on someone's feet. It's not valuable anymore in the natural. This, this would be like someone here giving $50,000 so we could rent a big arena for one night to pour out our extravagant worship on Jesus and walk away going, it was so worth it for one night only. That's what she did. No wonder Judas was like, That's, I get why he did it, but that was a waste. But she thought Jesus was worth it. So I want to close with a question today. Do you think Jesus is worth it? Worth what? You might be wondering. Whatever he's leading you to give to this campaign. Let's pray. God, Jesus, I think you're worth it. And I love you. And I think you've brought us to this point. And I thank you for the excitement. And I thank you for what this giving will produce in the natural. I thank you for this project. But God, I pray that your people who believe in you in this place, who want to give to this project, would give in such a way that they're really not giving to accomplish something even. They're giving to send a message to your heart about how they value you. They are giving as an act of worship. And it might be a sacrifice, but you're worth it. We love you, God, and we thank you for all you've done here today. We thank you for worship. We thank you for communion. We thank you for the prayers, God. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.